Welcome back to another episode of the MonsterCast with me. I have actually the announcer of the Ada Oklahoma show, Cameron Miguez. Along with me, of course, it is your local shut-in and uh, currently under training uh, computer scientist, of course, Mason Paul. Um, anyways, Cam, let's talk more about you and Ada Oklahoma this weekend. How is it going back to shows? Well, you see, Mason, it was uh, amazing. That was my <laughs> No, you know what? We had a great weekend. Trucks did really well. Show went good. Had a nice crowd. Uh, <clears throat> it was a lot of fun. It was it was nice getting to uh, see my babies. By my babies, I mean my trucks. Uh, had Bounty, Scarlet, Jekyll and Hyde, and Iron Outlaw there. And uh, had some ATV racing, some demo cross, which was a lot of fun to watch. I actually had a dude brought a limo out. Really? And yeah, it was it was really good. I, I need to apologize though. Uh, for one, for Wednesday night with Alex. Sorry, I was so in and out. I was just having a really hard time hearing. You know, we were tiring up a truck and just being outside trying to do my phone, so that didn't work. So sorry for. I should have just let Mason do that one on his own. He's better at this than I am anyway. But also, I said that I was going to try and do some tech stuff from the pits Friday night and get you guys up and close with the trucks, but I was unable to, we were just so far behind. We were trying to get track built and trucks set up and, uh, you know, just get ready for our first show out. Everybody trying to get reacclimated with putting a show on. So I apologize, but I promise here in the next few weeks when I'm out, we will do something like that. But otherwise Mason been doing anything or still just sitting on your computer. Sitting on my computer. Added some new things, playing around with some stuff. Actually, outside of that news, though, I did find out that the uh, Monster Truck Driving School, sponsored and uh, held off by uh, the Ratu family, had their first customer just recently. It was cool to see how that all went down and interesting how uh, now we're getting almost anyone that wants to come over and see if they can, you know, last in a Monster Truck. It seems like a real fun time. So I'm excited to see how. Uh, their future sales and other people that tune into that little uh, school go. Yeah. Well, everybody got to do something, try to keep making a living. But, uh, well, like I said, we'll try and do some stuff with some shows coming up. Like I said, I, I was hoping to have pictures of Outlaw and Jekyll. They both look beautiful in person. I, I was truly impressed with both trucks, but I blew it. I, I suck at what I do. So, it is what it is. What's that? And it is what it is. Mm, no, I'll get some stuff on here. We got some cool stuff coming up we want to do. But I say with that, oh, and so the other thing I want to say is I apologize for starting a half hour late. We're having some technical difficulties kind of with Gary Porter. Uh, apparently his uh, bag phone that he's on, uh, the camera's not working. So we will have him. He is here. But unfortunately, we will not be able to see his pretty face but we will hear us. You can still ask questions and comments. All that's working. So with that, Mason, let's bring in Mr. Gary Porter. Gary, where are you, sir? He just joined in, and it looked like it his his phone just dropped out again. I'm trying to get a hold of him and make sure I can get him back on here. 
This is this is, like I said, this is what happens when you hand a hillbilly a cell phone. <laughs> right. He just tries to chew on it. I guess we know from now on, no flip phones. It's a live and learn lesson tonight, but it is what it is. We're trying, guys. We want to get him on. I mean, I know he's hey, going to be. Can you hear us now? Hey, I got you now. There awesome. he is. How's well, let me read you it. Mr. Hall of Famer, Gary Porter. How are you, sir? Good. How about y'all guys? Well, we're good. We're good. So let's start off with uh, what's quarter, what's uh, quarantine been like for the Porter clan? Oh, man, I'm going to tell you what. We've been wide open. We've just been working, to be honest with you. Um, you know, living way out here in the sticks, we're not that close to anybody. So we just keep right at it going. So, so social distance isn't a problem there, is it? Not really. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about your career a little bit. I mean, you've been in this business for a minute. What what got you into monster trucks in the beginning? Well, I always had an interest in the big trucks, and uh, you know, seeing my Bigfoot. You know, back many many years ago when they were oh about the only truck, and then of course you had USA One and Austin Kong and some of them other guys. You know, um, doing a few shows around and. Back then, you basically just seen them in, in magazines, and um, and then I went to Indianapolis to the uh, Jamboree out there in eighty. I guess it was like nineteen eighty one or eighty two, and seen the, uh, you know, there was like five or six monster trucks out there at it, and uh, man, I just thought that was awesome. And then my brother owned a four wheel drive sh uh, center, and. Uh, wanted something to help advertise for it. And so I had a 72 Chevrolet that I was driving on the street and we decided to make it into a full-time uh, monster truck and put a big heavy frame under it and the 66s. And we had well, a monster truck. So how long did it, after you built that the first time, I mean, how quick did you start going to shows and starting to run a little bit with the big boys? Well, actually, um, oh my gracious, we had to work on the truck all night the night before. Uh, for my first little show was a car, a little car show out in a soybean field, actually, about 30 miles from the house. Um, some guys was having a truck show, and we went up there, and it took uh, four vehicles to transport the monster truck up there. Um, <laughs> you know, with a couple of tires in the back of my buddy's pickups and on different trailers and one thing and another. And, um, and then after that, uh, we really didn't do much until we took it to the Jamboree that fall, in the fall of 1985. And, of course, got some exposure out there. And then in January of the following year, I'd done some work for um, TNT Motorsports. And that sort of, you know, when I first got my start. And um, then the following summer, you know, I worked with a promoter, um, Dean Moore, out of Pennsylvania and did a lot of fairs and stuff up in that area. And that sort of got my name out in the, wasn't really the monster truck world at the time, but you know, the mud racing world, the truck and tractor pulling world. And, uh, you know, and that's where I got my, got my start at in uh, doing those. Well, so before we go any further, we, we have a young man we use on here by the name of Christopher Allen, always has a lot of information, usually a lot more information than the guest does about the guest. That's right. So, let's see what Christopher has to say about Gary Porter. Hey, I'm Gary Porter from Wadesboro, North Carolina. I'm the owner and driver of Carolina Crusher. No, I'm not. I'm Christopher Allen, the Monster Truck Guru, back for the 10th episode of Monster Truck Fact of the week. This recording is about Mr. Consistent, the man behind the Carolina Crusher, the real Gary Porter. After seeing the early monster trucks firsthand, Gary decided to build his own. The result was the first of several versions of Carolina Crusher, which made its public debut in 1985. As the sport got progressively lighter and faster, Gary rebuilt the Crusher several times to adapt to this ever-changing motorsport. Gary was also a literal lone traveler, doing most everything related to the Crusher by himself 
for the large majority of his career. After selling the final version of Carolina Crusher to Paul Schaefer, he joined Monster Jam where and was gifted to see in the legendary Grave Digger. His only competition appearance in the World Finals was in 2001, the second time they ran the event driving Spider-Man, although he did make encore appearances in the Grave Digger anniversary years. In 2015, Carolina Crusher was brought back under corporate ownership to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the original's debut back in 1985. Two years later, Gary Porter retired, but not before getting inducted into the International Monster Truck Hall of Fame in Auburn, Indiana in the year 2013, which you fans can visit. Gary is known for being a racer and has the results to back it up. He finished fourth in the inaugural TNT Monster Truck Challenge Point Series in 1988, finished second only to Equalizer the very next year, and two years later, 1991, finally got a championship winning the first ever Panda Point Series, besting names like Bigfoot, Barefoot, and Taurus to do so. And that is your 10th episode of Monster Truck Fact of the Week, fans. We hope you enjoyed these videos. Please like Monster Trucking with Jim and Chris on Facebook and Instagram for loads of excellent Monster Truck Show coverage. Please like this page for new episodes and remember, Monster Trucks forever! Well, hell, Gary, I don't know what you think, but I thought that was a pretty good impression of you. That guy's awesome. He is awesome. <laughs> like I said, he can remember more about me than I can myself. But uh, and and that's what makes the monster truck world unique. I mean, it's fans like that. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, and it's just uh, humbling to me that um, you know somebody is that involved, you know, in the in the monster trucks and uh, has all those stats and everything. And the cool thing about him is, is him and his family. They're amazing people. Uh, they're friends with everybody. They treat everybody well. But that young man knows all that stuff. He didn't go research you to figure it all out. He actually knows all that stuff off the top of his head. So That's he's, right. That's right. I, yeah, he, I can remember he's all that. That's right. So uh, that's why we use him because I don't know shit. So I have to use him. <laughs> I know how to make a truck go. I don't know anything about the people sitting in the seat. Right, right. But he uh, he, he knows us. He sure does. That's that's incredible. Well, so let's talk about the, the TNT days and the Penda days. I mean, it was a whole different world back then. You guys actually had to go to events and qualify a lot of times. We had Dan Patrick on a few weeks ago, and he, he was talking about the whole qualifying aspect to actually get in the show. So talk about that a little bit. That's right. Back in the TNT days, you know, it started uh, – <laughs> you know, racing for a purse and, um, you know, you could win pretty good. And that was pretty much designed, uh, you know, they were figuring Bigfoot would win all the races. And so they pretty much set the purse where his booking fee was. So, you know, he would still get his big money, but us lesser guys, you know, of course, you know, we would get the leftovers, but then as we started getting faster and faster and started winning uh, a few races, they sort of had to um, rethink that. And, um, <laughs> you know, when actually there was a few of us that were, we were, uh, I got to the spot that uh, I was guaranteed, you know, and they, there was just a few of us. We were guaranteed a minimum to show up. And then it was against our winnings. You know, if we won more than what our guarantee was, you know, we got paid extra, but if not, they guaranteed us. Um, you know, I think there were like four trucks of us on the TNT series that we were um, we were guaranteed a minimum amount to show up. And so, and that, and that helped a lot. But, you know, other than that, we had to qualify and race. And, uh, you know, that'll bring out the good and the bad in the competitors. Man, I have seen some um, fierce verbal fights. And... Um, <laughs> At some of them races, I mean, it's just uh, it's just amazing what money will do to somebody, you know, when they think they might be getting cheated out of a dollar. Well, so now he said in there, you know, you took fourth place one year and then you, then you ran with Equalizer, took second place, and then finally got your first championship in 91. All right. I mean, how rewarding was that to actually pull off a championship against the likes of guys that are all Hall of Famers now, your average Jasper, David, you know, Equalizer, David Moore, all them guys. Oh, it was, it was incredible. And, um, you know, I was a, a 
a one man um, fight going to those races. And I used to pick at Bigfoot and tell them that a one little soldier out there was uh, beating their whole army, you know, because they <laughs> would bring, oh my gracious, they would bring everybody from the shop, you know, they would have their engine guide or transmission guy, the rear end guy, the guy to wipe the dust off the truck. I mean, they just had <laughs> unlimited funds and they was coming out there and, uh, you know, I won the series. And so I was, uh, I'm not going to say I was the underdog, but I sure wasn't a favorite to have been picked at the beginning of that season to walk away with that championship. And, um, you know, and, and Bigfoot, on the other hand, that same season, they was trying a lot of um, new stuff. You know, they switched over to the ZF axles. Um, Andy Brass, they was running um, lockers and stuff in the, in the front ends, and they couldn't get that figured out. And so, you know, they was having some mechanical issues also with uh, Bigfoot 8, you know, that year. Like I said, they switched to the ZF axles, and they were having a problem breaking those. So, um you know, mechanical failure, you know, really cost them that championship, you know, in the end. And I was just able to be consistent and uh, and be there when the other trucks were breaking. Well, now, how hard was it to make the transition from going from the five tons under, a, you know, lease spring truck to going to a lighter tube chassis? I mean, how much figured just to how to build this lighter truck within all of a sudden now you've got large travel, you know, I think around then you were running like 18, 20 travel shocks as opposed to leaf springs. Right. I mean, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty simple, but they were a lot of learning there also, um, you know, with your sprung weight and your unsprung weight and just trying to figure out the um, um, geometry and everything on your four link bars and what would work and how much travel, you know, you could get with the uh, drive shaft yokes and, and, uh, you know, your pinion angle and all that kind of stuff, you know, back in the early days. And, of course, there wasn't as much um, stuff built for the monster trucks that they are today that's designed for the monster trucks. You know, we were borrowing available parts from other uh, applications and putting them on monster trucks. And so there was, uh, was a learning curve on that on some of, uh, you know, what parts would work and what wouldn't work you know, with the um, increase in the suspension travel. Well, and, and what I would see being the other hard part, like for me now, like us and that are doing this now, is we can walk around, there's a hundred other trucks out there that are all similar to ours, and we can look at little minor different things. But back then, you didn't have 20 other trucks you could go walk around and see what everybody else was doing. There was only a handful that you could even try and get ideas of what might work and what might not. Right, and, um, you know, I walked around and, Check the Bigfoot trucks out a lot. Um, Jack Wilman with Taurus, you know, learned a lot from him. Um, you know, Fred Schaefer, he was always trying uh, new stuff. And, uh, you know, I learned a lot from him. Um, you know, me and Jack used to have some some good conversations and would have some good arguments, you know, about um, the weight of the trucks. You know, his first Taurus four-link truck to come out, um, you know, he had some small ZF axles under it, and I think it was weighing um, about 6,000 or 6,500 pounds or something. And, uh, Holy crap. you know, it done a good job. You know, and then, um, you know, he came to, actually, he came to a couple of TNT races and, and won them. You know, we couldn't touch them with our leaf spring trucks. And then <laughs> uh, TNT, they didn't want that to happen. They didn't want one truck to come dominate. And so, you know, they actually didn't invite him back, you know, for a while. And they got us drivers together and told us it was up to us that they wanted us to tell them what a monster truck was and the rules <laughs> that uh, specified what a monster truck was because they wanted a pretty level playing field at their shows. And they didn't want a single guy winning all the time. Right. And so we sit in Gary Cook's trailer up in, um, I think it was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And that's when we decided that, hey, a monster truck was 10,000 pounds. You know, it was sort of a, a happy median where the weight of the trucks were at the time. 
you know, there was a few trucks lighter and several trucks heavier, but everybody was working downward, you know, in the weight at the time. And, right. uh, you know, cubic inches, you know, when we come up with a 575 cubic inches, because at the time, um, I think there was one or two trucks that was running like a 640, but there were a lot of trucks that was running 468s and, uh, you know, 496s. And so we sort of met in the middle there at a, a 575 cubic inches. And the same thing with the blowers. You know, um, there was a couple of trucks running, um, you know, a, a 1271 blower at the time. But the majority of the people were running 671s. And so we decided, you know, let's call it an 871, a maximum. And then, you know, of course, the 10% overdrive. And that sort of set the standard in the industry what a monster truck was by that one little meeting in Gary Cook's trailer up in Kalamazoo, um, Michigan. Well, so now how cool is it to, I mean, for me, it just, it's, it's, it's an awe moment to think that you're sitting there because here we are in 2020 and even in the biggest company in the world, Monster Jam, Feld Entertainment, the maximum cubic inches in a, in a motor is 575. The maximum blower we can run is 871, 10%. I mean, you guys set the standard for this business all these years later. I mean, for me to sit here and even talk to you about it, it's pretty damn cool. I mean. Uh, yeah. yeah, it goes back a long ways. And that was, was um, you know, that was with TNT Motorsports. And uh, and that's when we come up. There were some guys running, the, you know, dual uh I can't call the guy's name now, but he had dual tractor tires on his truck. There were some guys running um, 73s, and there were some guys running, um, I think it was like the 6734 skitter tires. And that's when, you know, we'd say, hey, a monster truck has 66 by 43s on it. You know, if you want to go bigger, you know, but you get the minimum, you got to have that tire. Of course, nobody wanted to run bigger when you was out there racing, um, you know, because of the, the extra weight. Right. And, um, you know, your safety harnesses and stuff. I mean, uh, a lot of that was in one meeting and one afternoon up in, in uh, Gary Cook's trailer. And uh, that's how it, all, uh, how it all came about. And, uh, you know, there, there you go, Jack Wilman. You know, this was, uh, I think this might have been before Bigfoot 8 was even built you know jack had the honeycomb sponsorship and he took okay. that money and hired an engineer and he built a light monster truck you know that worked i think he had problems with the fox shocks that was on it but um you know he he started the ball rolling with a four link tube frame truck that was really light well now so uh, so I don't hog this whole conversation a little bit, but I, I just got a couple more questions for you before we go to comments. But so let's move forward a little bit. And, you know, you guys were doing primarily racing in the Penda series and then it started switching to where it, now you started adding freestyle to the shows. What was it like making that change? And for you guys at first, was it better or was it just something you weren't into right away or? Well, that's sort of where we started. You know, was freestyle at the mud bogs, the truck and tractor pulls, um, you know, because we just didn't do anything until the end. And we went out there and done some wheelies and um, done freestyle, you know, when all that was said and done. And then um, actually the first racing that I can ever remember, and I know I've talked to Dennis Anderson about this, the first racing that we ever done was down in Puerto Rico with Dean Moore, which was uh, Monsters on Wheels back in 87. And we did side-by-side -side racing down there. And then it was uh, later on in 87 that TNT started doing a couple of side-by-side -side races. You know, and then 88, of course, they went with the uh, – you know, that uh, series, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, and then at TNT, you know, Dennis, 
unfortunately, he wasn't that good of a racer. You know, his equipment <laughs> wouldn't hold up. And he's like, man, I'm going broke. And he kept telling Scott Johnson, man, please, you know, let me go out there and make a T-shirt run. Let me go make a T-shirt run. And so it got where they would let him go after he broke, you know, in, uh, you know, the first round of racing that they would be back in the pits working on his truck. And then at the end of the show, they would let him go out and make a pass to sell Mm, mm, t-shirts. And that's when they started seeing, Hey, the people really like this. Well, then we had to do racing and then they would choose two or three, four trucks to go out and do freestyle. And they, they sort of rotated it, you know, on a three show weekend, you know, if there was 12 trucks, you know, they would split it up and, you know, four of us would go out and do freestyle, you know, at one performance over the weekend. And then, uh, you know, it's just grown from there of what the monster trucks can do in freestyle. Now, when you first started doing that, I mean, was that something you were into? Did you like it when it was your turn or was it a, uh, I wonder how much it's going to end up costing me? Well, as tight as I am, it was one of them things. Oh my gosh, how much is this going to cost me? Cause they, <laughs> they didn't pay extra. Right. You know, it was just, you know, the promoter got more for free. And so, but if I, I mean, if I went out there and done a good job and didn't tear nothing up and the crowd liked me and I got one of the crowd applause, then man, it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But you know, if I went out there and tore my truck up and didn't win, then I wasn't a happy camper. <laughs> well, so on here, one of our big things is we love to have fans come in here and ask questions and comments to you. So as much as I would love to just sit here and hog this whole thing, I could talk to you all night. I better let them get involved or they'll get mad at me. So, Mason, what do you got so far, bud? I want to start off with John Seesock here with his little two-parter. Uh, he wanted to make sure that Gary knew he needs a cup and a long string for the next episode. <laughs> and follow up with that. <laughs> follow up that. A win against Gary meant more to me than anyone out here. He never made mistakes and always had a way to get in your head. You beat yourself trying to beat him. Nothing but love and a great respect for this legend. Wow, John, the awesome good. guy. I mean, man, he used to come to Bloomsburg and hang out with me before he uh, had his first monster truck. And, uh, you know, he was uh, he was there every jamboree, you know. And uh, like I said, I was traveling by myself at the time and, and doing these points races. But, um, you know, at a, at a lot of our tours and the, the stops and everything, you know, I would have a, a, a great fan that turned into a great friend, you know, there waiting on me to help me and uh, do what they could to, uh, to get me through the weekend. And, and, and John Seasock's a class act. I mean, he was always one oh, of the coolest guys, you know, and a hell of a driver. So that's, that's pretty complimentary talking about how good you are against him. Yeah. I always uh, thought the world of John and, uh, and his two sons also, I mean, uh, both of them are awesome kids. Well, they're not kids anymore. They're probably 40 years yeah. old, as old as I'm getting, but, I mean, they did. They did. I mean, he had a he had a nice family and would bring his sons and everybody to the to the races, and uh, it's pretty awesome. We have our next question here from Levi Shones asking, "What was the most fun to you, TNT, USHRE, or Penda?" The most fun, yeah, TNT. TNT. I mean, it was uh, a group of guys. I mean, we had a lot of fun, and that was before it got too serious, you know, with the racing. Uh, you know, we were still racing for a, a purse, but everybody would pitch in and work on their trucks, everybody's trucks, and uh, man, it was just one family. Um, you know, um, Mike Wine, um, uh, Buffalo Trimmer, uh, you know, John Moore, uh, you know, the big My favorite guys, truck. man, there are so many people that we traveled every weekend and it was like one big family. And um, it, it was a lot of fun. You know, when it comes showtime, the racing, we were serious. But when it was over, you know, we was out there helping each other and trying to make sure 
the guys, you know, had their truck ready for the next day. And then, um, you know, we all traveled together a lot. Um, not only because we were one big family, but most of us didn't have dependable haul rigs. So we wanted to travel <laughs> with somebody in case we broke down. You know, we would have some help there beside the road. Well, so real quick along those lines, you know, you talk about the family and, and nowadays we all, you know, for us that are in it, all know about the monster truck family. You know, we all take care of each other. But during that, when it got serious there for a minute, was there a minute where all of a sudden that kind of went away to where the guys just stuck to everybody stuck to their own truck, trying to make sure they were better than everybody else? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's grown like that. And uh, gradually, you know, it went to that. Um, you know, I would say the last um, five or six years that I was driving, you know, it, it definitely, you know, got like that. And there at the end of the, when we were actually running for a, a points, you know, it, it, get, it got pretty tough there. You know, everybody was out for each other. And, you know, of course, when you had a Dodge, you know, giving Fred Schaefer money and then uh, as competitive as uh, Jack Wilman, you know, is and, and Bob Chandler. I mean, it got it got pretty rough, you know, when they're at, at, at some events, you know, when they was trying to uh, prove their points. It got some, uh, they were some interesting times at the shows. Hmm. What else you got, Mason? I was just looking at this one comment from William Carroll Arnold talking about interesting moments. His question is, huge fan, Gary, got a three-parter for you. What were your thoughts on being run over by Snakebite? Were there any sour feelings in the pits afterwards? And what changes to the sport were made because of this incident? <clears throat> I don't know if there were any changes made to the sport because of that in, uh, incident, but, um, you know, I will say, um, you know, I was running the next round there when snake bite run over me. I, Gene, I don't know where Gene's head was at at the time, you know, cause he had had a couple of accidents, but, um, you know, I will give Bob Chandler and the, and the Bigfoot crew, um, Man, they stepped up to the plate. They took responsibility, and they paid for the damage on my truck from that accident. Well, that's cool. It is. It is. They they paid they paid for the damage, and uh, you know Bob, you know he was uh, you know said it shouldn't have happened, and he was sorry it happened, and um, yeah, they stepped up to the plate, and uh, and they paid for my damage. And I well, think that's, that's good... probably the probably the only time in the monster truck industry that one competitor has paid for the damage on another competitor's vehicle that I'm aware of. Yeah, that's a pretty cool thing to hear because it'd be really easy to just say, well, that's racing. That's right. That's right. But, uh, you know, for a truck to cross a, a concrete wall and then run on <laughs> down the track a little bit further and hit you from behind and spin you around and <laughs> run over you, that wasn't really racing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it wasn't, uh, let's see here, it was somewhere along in there about the same time. It wasn't much longer uh, prior to that. You know, uh, Fred Schaefer and myself got together in Oklahoma City. And actually, that was a worse crash out there when we got together and Fred crossed the center line mm -hmm. when we were. Um, racing and when he jumped he jumped to the left he was in the right hand lane he jumped to the left and when he landed his left front tire was between my two right tires and that was a pretty pretty wild crash i would say that was one of the wildest crashes in the monster truck industry you know at the time but um you know that was that was more of a racing accident there right yeah, I can't imagine you sit too many times at a show waiting to get rear-ended. No, not especially when they're a concrete wall. You know, probably, um, <laughs> what was a pit wall there at the racetrack, stood, what, two feet, two and a half feet high, you know, and he, he run over it and never slowed down. 
I mean, I had my turn signals on and my brake light was working, so I don't know yeah. why he rear-ended me and spun me. Yeah, Tim has it, bro, and that's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> what else you got, Mason? We have one here from Mackenzie Ray, and the question is, talk about guys getting mad. How about the time you and Mike Wine went to rib Dennis Anderson in Louisville, Kentucky in 89 at Freedom Hall? Holy crap. Went to rip them. Read that one more time, Mason. Yeah. So how about the time you and Mike Wine went to rib Dennis Anderson in Louisville, Kentucky in 89? Oh, went man. to rib him? I'm reading, yeah. R-I-B, rib. Rib him. Yeah. Okay, why don't we uh, – I don't know what that was about. I mean, if I had a little more information on what that was about, I might could bring it back to my memory. But yeah, let's go to exactly let's go to another about. question. Let's go to another question. Mackenzie, if you could kind of rephrase that, we'll make sure we get it so we rephrase that question a little bit so we can see what you're talking about. We'll go to another question while she types in. Yeah, we have one here from Nick Bogler asking, any good stories from Wildwood? I've been attending the event from – hang on. Lost my connection here for a second. All right. Sorry about that. I've been attending the event almost every year since it started and have always enjoyed watching you dominate and get king of the beach pretty much every year in Wildwood. Yeah, Wildwood was always good to me. And, um, you know, I figured out pretty quick up there you had to have full cleated tires. And so, you know, once I – um. Uh, sold my truck and stuff and started driving for Gravedigger, you know, cause I would always take Carolina Crusher up there with some, uh, you know, with some cut tires and, you know, I could get it to slide around those turns uh, pretty good and get good traction with those cut tires. And then, um, you know, when I worked, went to work for Field driving Gravedigger, uh, a lot of times I would have some, you know, some slick tires, some of the China tires or, or, um, Tires of bars have been cut off, but I would always go by the shop out there and uh, and pick up a set of tires that hadn't been cut to, uh, <laughs> to take up there for that sand. And uh, yeah, it was a fun place to go to. Uh, man, I went up there a number of years, and um, yeah, I'd still like to drive on that track. Sure would. That was a fun time. Well, so let's talk a little bit. How exactly did it work out with you selling your truck and you going to work for Monster Jam? Um, you know, when I sold my Carolina Crusher to Paul Schaefer, I had a, a contract with him and uh, an agreement that I would, uh, after he bought it, that I would drive for him for one year. And as that was ending, um, we were doing a show up in English Town, New Jersey, and Dennis was up there with grave digger and uh he was like man what you going to do when you, you know your contract ends with paul or something i was like i don't know i said i hadn't got all that figured out yet i said probably just going to hang around the house and then uh he's like well you know let's see what's going on and then it wasn't but a uh maybe a, it might have been the following week or a couple of weeks later um bill easterly called me and asked me if i would be interested in driving uh, a grave digger truck for them. And, uh, you know, and my comment was then I said, well, I said, that all depends, Bill. I said, it depends if you want me to drive like Gary Porter, if you want me to drive like Dennis Anderson. And he's like, I want you to drive like Gary Porter, like you always have. And I was like, well, I'm interested. <laughs> and so it, ju it just went from there. Uh, and that was, an honor. Yeah. that was an honor to get to drive grave digger for all those years. Um, you know, some incredible big shoes to fill. And uh, and really, I didn't realize the, how huge the fan base was difference between Carolina Crusher and, and Gravedigger until I stepped into that Gravedigger truck. And uh, they were a big difference there in the fan base. Well, and that's, that's funny you say that because we had Jack Caberno in last week, and he talked kind of about the same thing when he built a Gravedigger, went and drove it for – uh, I think he said like three or four months and he, he was saying kind of the same thing of how dedicated and big the grave digger fan base and the fans were to that truck. That's right. I mean, Dennis, you know, and Dennis worked for it, you know, because Dennis and I, I done my first show 
with Dennis down in uh, Anderson, South Carolina, and um, I guess it was 86. Adam was just, I think he was just a few weeks old, and it was the first paint job, first show for Dennis with the new paint job, which is the existing paint job now, you know, the graveyard scene. Before it was just the um, the uh, blue and the, the gray truck, and this was his first show with the paint job and he had rice and canes he had the narrow tractor tires on it and he got paid half of what i was getting paid because <laughs> i had the 66 inch tall tires and 43 <laughs> inches wide and he went out there and put on a show and he was <laughs> there for the fans and i've seen i've seen dennis I mean, numerous times, you know, we started hanging out together and, and traveling together because neither one of us had dependable rigs. And, um, you know, I mean, I enjoyed his company and he's fun to travel with for sure. And, uh, you know, man, I've seen him many nights with a truck that we would just have to take a loader and load it up in pieces, but he would never leave the fence from signing autographs until that last fan was taken care of. Never. And I would be over there, I'd be walking away from the fence and I would have my stuff loaded up and he would be standing there signing autographs. So Dennis worked and he, he was dedicated to them fans also. <laughs> That's cool. Crazy. What else you got, Mason? Before we, Mackenzie actually just commented a little bit back ago going on her uh, comment earlier, but I did want to highlight one thing from John Seesock talking back about Wildwood. Sounds like you guys have a story about this. And he was saying, how about have the same trailer keys in Wildwood? <laughs> yeah. Yep, story. It took a long time for him to figure that one out. <laughs> but uh, we would go out there on the beach and get them um, – I don't know what you call them, horseshoe crabs or something, them big old crabs with a shell on them. I mean, about mm -hmm. eight or 10 inches in diameter. I mean, them things would be rotten and stinking, and we'd unlock John's trailer and stick them in John's trailer, and he couldn't ever figure out how in the world them things was getting in there for the longest. And, it's <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even remember how we figured out how it had the same key for his trailer. But, oh, man, that was funny. Yeah, we did it more than one time. Somebody was using master lock. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that was pretty cool. <laughs> and, uh, All right. What, you got McKenzie's? Yeah, just line it up right here. She said, that's the show that Dennis got mad and stood on digger on end against Mike Wine and Jersey Outlaw. It was a joke that went wrong between you, Mike, and uh, you and Mike against Dennis. Oh, there were so many jokes. I mean, I can't remember which one went, went wrong between me and Dennis. <laughs> oh, man, we used to joke and pick and carry on with each other so much. And then um, a lot of times one of the two officers would end up getting in trouble. And we'd be mad at each other for a little bit. But, you know, by the time the show was over, we was over it. Or, you know, it didn't last long. I had a bunch of fun with Dennis traveling up and down the roads. And, man, I got more war stories that could be told and a lot that couldn't be told and um yeah i don't know exactly which one because man and mike wine you're talking about an instigator he was a big <laughs> instigator and so yeah he would get me and dennis in trouble a lot of times and it wasn't either one of us his fault but uh <laughs> mike would be right there in the mix of it well speaking of that you know something we always ask every week is we ask somebody you know pick out a favorite road story whether it be while you were traveling or at a show whether it be a prank or something you you got a good one you always like to share oh man i got a bunch of good ones we don't have that much time i got all the time in the world i got nowhere to be but <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah i reckon the weather well, one that comes to the mind back up in um this was like in the probably about 89 or so with TNT. We had went out on uh, Long Island out to Uniondale to the Nassau County Coliseum and done a, a TNT race. And it was um, myself and uh, Dennis Anderson and 
Gary Wiggins with Mopar Magic. And we all left together, and I was sort of leading the pack on coming out of there. And I had a camper mounted on the back of an international at the time, and I had a toolbox built in the, what was the wheel well of the tag-along camper. And I hit one of those big potholes up there, and the, the door come open, and I seen my grinder and some tools flying out of it. And so I pulled over at like an intersection there between the um, – the interstates up there well dennis come in behind me and then uh, of course wigan stopped and i was trying to get my doors closed and get my stuff back together there and wiggins got out of his hauler he had a international with a camper on the back of it also and he had a single axle trailer that he hauled his monster truck on and he looked back there and that thing had broke over the axle and the rear of the trailer was dragging the ground. And so we had to end up taking blocks and blocking under, this is all on open trailers, <laughs> blocking up the frame of the monster truck to sit over the axle. And then we took chains and run from the back of his monster truck down to the rear of the trailer and jacked the, <laughs> pulled the trailer up so the back of the monster truck was holding the trailer up off the ground. <laughs> so then we took off from there and we didn't get but a few miles and Dennis was like, whoa, 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 the engine just blew up. Well, he had a GMC Brigadier with a um, like a like a 653, I think it was, a Detroit mm -hmm. motor in it. Man, that thing would scream, but it blew up. <laughs> and so here we were on the top of these, on the interstate, you know, which is a bridge all the way through like Brooklyn and Manhattan. And now when we was up there trying to figure out what we were going to do, because, you know, he didn't have the money to call a tow truck and all three of us together didn't have the money to call a tow truck <laughs> up there. So he had a tank strap, a big rope, and I was in front of him and we took airlines and run down the side of my camper down and hung it off the rear bumper of my monster truck, tied it to the mirror of his hauler and run it under and hooked to the airline on his truck so he could release the brakes. And while we were doing all this, people down below got the holler net as well. Me and Dennis were big smokers back then. We were out of cigarettes and we was about to panic so them guys went to the convenience store and bought cigarettes and threw two of us up there on the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got everything rigged up. Well, we took off, you know, down the interstate. I'm pulling Dennis, you know, with this rope. And we got the airline hanging from my monster <laughs> truck to his hauler. And Wiggins is behind him. And we go down through there. And a car, like a little... Uh, Suzuki Samurai uh, got in between them somehow and they run him off the road and he hit a curb and, and slid around and he about flipped. Holy well, then we get to a toll booth. A guy in a Cadillac tries to get between us and it gets about halfway between us and this rope is like 20 feet long and this guy's car is like 19 feet long and i don't know how in the world he got in there but anyway he got he I was able to get out well then dennis started coming closer to me at these toll booths so a car couldn't get between me and him with the rope between us now and he let slack get in the airline whip dropped down and wrapped around his front tire on his hog <laughs> So there we were stuck, and so we had to get out. And we was out there, you know, undoing the airline, taking all our clamps loose, unwrapping it from around his uh, tire. And here comes the guy with the, at the tool booth. He come walking out there, and he looked at us, and he's like, "Are y'all the guys that I see on Tough Tracks? Are y'all the guys that?" Are on TV and was like, yeah, I said, you know, he said, well, that's the Carolina Crusher and there's Gravedigger and there's Mopar Magic. You guys are the ones that are on TV 
and you're out here going up and down the road on this piece of junk, hollers <laughs> like this. I said, man, I thought y'all were some kind of superstars or something, and y'all were riding up and down the road in all this junk with all this junk. We was like, yep. And so we get the airline straightened out, and he lets us go on through his toll booth. <laughs> and we get on, and we get on, um, um, we fist and get on the New Jersey Turnpike. So I pull up to the toll booth. I get my ticket, and I pull up, and Dennis is on the CB radio. All right, a little bit, a little bit, hold. So he could get his toll ticket. Or well, the guy, he seen the strap hooked together, you know, between us. And he jumped out of that toll booth and he told us we wasn't getting on the toll <coughs> road with all that mess. And he made us turn around and uh, we went over and got us a motel room. And I'm not kidding you. I think there were eight people in that motel room that night because we put our money together to get us one motel room. And, um, yeah, that was quite an experience. I won't ever forget that one. Well, you know, we've had a lot of good stories on here, but by God, you win. <laughs> that one was tough. Oh, man, we could go <laughs> on and on and on the crazy stuff that happened to us back in the day. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's pretty you, wild. You, you definitely win. Uh, in fact, I will challenge any guest I have from this point on to top that story. Oh, wow. Yeah, I could go on with an, another one that just come to memory, too. And uh, I wasn't even there for this one. But I was there for the aftermath of it. I had another show to do. But they was up in um, Middletown, New York, doing a show. And that's when we done what they call the, the mini series, where it was, you know, we would race about five nights a week. And we would just jump from town to town to town up in the Northeast. And... Um, we had done Middletown. Well, they had done Middletown, New York, and then we went to West Lebanon, New York. And at, at Middletown, of course, they was drinking and everything after the show, and everybody got wild. Well, there were some track drying cars that the track left out there. Well, hmm. I see here. I think there were about four. Dennis and John Moore, Rich Hooser. And then they got in the track drying cars where they started having their own race. <laughs> well, then, um, no, when Rod Litzow was in one, I'm sorry, Rich Hooser. It was Rich Hooser or Rod Litzow one went and got in their monster truck and chased them. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I mean, they said they was running like 40, 30 or 40 miles an hour around this track with a monster truck, you know, right on their tail. Well, <laughs> they ended up, they had to pay uh, for the track drying cars and Dennis had made a deal with the guy there at the track to buy a welder from them. And we got over there to West Lebanon, Tom Carter with TNT. He didn't know that Dennis had bought it. And so Tom pulled up over there and he uh, seen the welder sitting on the front. It was actually on the front neck of uh, Gary Wiggins' trailer. It was like, where'd y'all get it at? And Dennis said, from over there in Middletown. And Tom was like, what you talking about? He was like, man, is that that guy was such a butthole and made us pay for them uh, race cars that want nothing but junk anyway. I said, I just took his welder. <laughs> and boy, Tom, he about come unglued, but that was a, that was a classic there. <laughs> but, yeah, we used to have a lot of fun, and man, like, why we didn't get in more trouble than what we did at the shows. <laughs> Our stories suck now compared to what your guys' were. Jesus. Like oh, it was, pretty, it was pretty wild. <laughs> what else you got, Mason? We actually have quite a bit. I'm uh, we're looking at the 55-minute mark here, but you wouldn't mind going a little bit longer here, Gary, right? That's fine. All right, perfect. We have uh, – oh, here's one from Zach Hammond asking, ask Gary about wits Eden habit. Oh my gosh, we had eaten the habit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he had an eating habit. He would eat long as somebody else was paying for it, for sure. Because <laughs> they would, uh, I'd ask them a lot of times, him and uh, uh, Cody was traveling with me and we up most of the time, hey, y'all want to go eat? Y'all want to do it? No, 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 no. We wouldn't be hungry. And now I was like, well, I'll. You know, I was just going to let you know I was going to buy. Well, Whip would be all of a sudden, man, he would be all into it. 
<laughs> he would go eat then, and he went overseas. I think it was for thirty days and spent like thirty seven dollars the whole time he was gone. <laughs> but he was um he would get crackers and stuff from the show office and stuff. You know, the little snacks at the show office. He would get that stuff and squirrel it and he would eat <laughs> off of it during the week. <laughs> and he just uh, yeah. He's got some eating habits. And they're connected <laughs> connected to his wallet. <laughs> He was definitely a different character. <laughs> I like Gwyn. I still see him. He comes by the shop occasionally. Yeah, he was fun to be around. Yeah. What else you got? We have one actually from Daniel Cheech Agosh from Crush This just now, and he's asking, ask him about having Gary Wiggins and Tom Tesmer on the team. Oh yeah, Gary. Gary was a good driver. I mean, you know, he ran the Mopar Magic, and then when I started the second truck, you know, I hired him to to drive it, and um, yeah, he done a good job for me. Man, that was back in the day when me and him both we traveled by ourselves, um, pretty much. And uh, you know, Tom, he would help. He would help Wiggins some, and um, yeah, man, I don't know what all trouble they would get in because I wouldn't hear the whole story. You know, all the time, but uh, they had a lot of fun. Just hear the parts that they think you need to hear. That's right. That's right. <laughs> of course, that was back before cell phones and uh, video cameras in your pocket and everything with these phones, man. I want to tell you what, if we'd had cell phones and stuff back then, we'd still be in jail. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot harder to get away with shit now. Uh, that's right. <laughs> back then i mean if you didn't see it it really didn't happen but now man exactly. everybody's got it recorded it's what i always tell people it's not illegal if you don't get caught yeah <laughs> we have one here from uh joey sullivan saying ask gary about some of the greatest times we had traveling over the road <laughs> always enjoyed speaking on me like in california with dennis anderson and tommy powers oh yeah joey he's been a good friend for years and uh Man, I met him when he had his first monster truck up in Richmond, Virginia. And um, I was going to California for a while to do some shows, and I asked Joey to go with me. And uh, he went out there, and um, I was just hauling one monster truck in the trailer at the time. And I had a black Chevrolet uh, pickup that I could put in the trailer and, and take with me. And we had it out there, and we were going uh, – maybe like from Fresno up to San Jose or somewhere to do a show because we would hang out down there in Fresno at a, at a shop at a, and we were going up through there and me and Dennis had pretty good size CB radios at the time. And we was going up through there and Joey was driving on my pickup, you know, he had this big old head full of curly hair and um, Dennis got on his radio he was like, man, look at that girl driving that black pickup. Look at that girl <laughs> driving that black pickup, you know, northbound on, uh, I think, Interstate 5 out there. He said, man, she's got some nice ones. She's got some pretty legs and everything. And then the truck drivers were like, where's she at? Where's she at? And then, man, they were just hammered down to catch up with us. And we sort of slowed down because Joey was running with us, me and Dennis slowed down so the other truck drivers could catch up with us. And then they all got up there and seen it was Joey driving the truck. <laughs> but from behind, they thought he was a girl with all that hair blowing in the wind. <laughs> yeah, and, and Tommy, he's a character too. Yeah, we can't tell them stories. Yeah, we ain't looking to get nobody arrested or divorced. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how long the statute of limitations last. Or the uh, statute of limitations on being ignorant. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think there is one. <laughs> Tuning on a few questions, though. We actually have some pretty big names that commented in earlier. I have one from uh, Tyler Andrew, aka Mr. Meninga, commented in earlier saying, "Thanks for letting me skip school and help out with you every time you came to Iowa. Learned a lot from you and you and Wit." Oh man, yeah, yeah. He came to a show out there. Was at um, there in Iowa, there at Tony Stewart's track, and uh, man, the little kid come up in a pickup, and 
man, I skipped school today. My mom and dad let me skip school today. And I just <laughs> wondered if we could hang out with y'all today. I said, well, I don't remember if it was me or Witt. Well, if you want to hang out with us, you got to give us a ride to the restaurant to eat. And uh, <laughs> anyway, he gave us a ride and, uh, man, ate lunch with us. And um, who who would ever know that, uh, you know, he's turned out to be the driver that he is. I mean, it's awesome. Amazing, amazing driver. Yes, he is. And a damn good kid. A hell of a young yeah. man. Yeah, sure is. I'm glad mine and Witt's uh, influence was so strong. I want to be turned out so good after that uh, one weekend. Yeah, well, you know, you you have that effect on people. I've only got a couple of kids. I've become a better person because of it. Yeah, it must be that Southern hillbilly accent or something that done it. Well, it's because we can't understand half of what you say, so we just kind of take oh, it for what it is. There you go. <laughs> Speaking of influence, we had Cody Saucier commenting earlier as well, saying your influence on me runs thick. You always had the image the industry needed. Long, long time fan. I really wish we could have lined up together and hope to see you again sometime soon. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what, Cody's been an awesome driver too and an awesome guy. And, um, you know, um, not only him, but, you know, Frank Kremel. I mean, uh, you know, he's uh, sent me pictures of him, a little bitty snotty-nosed kid, you know, coming to the shows. Well, I don't know, he had to be like 8 or 10, 12 years old or something. But, um, I mean, it's just incredible. And it's really hard to believe that, you know, those kids were coming to the shows, you know, back in the early days. And, you know, it's just an, an honor, you know, to have that uh, positive influence on them and, uh, you know, um, and to hear these comments, you know, that they have. Well, and it's it's cool because all of them have as much respect for this business and the people who got all of us where we are now. I mean, if it wasn't for guys like you, Dan Patrick, Jack Aberna, Dennis Anderson, Bob Chandler. None of us would have a cool job. We'd all be working at Walmart. That's right. And, uh, you know, um, I think I'm probably speaking for Dennis. Uh, I know I am, you know, myself and probably um, Dan Patrick. And I would say probably 90% of the early guys that was in the sport, we didn't get in it to get out of it what we did. I mean, I got in it to have fun for a couple of years. And then uh, fast forward, man, I got 32 years out of it. You know, made a living at it, had a lot of fun, you know, a lot of fans, and uh, and it was enjoyable. And uh, I don't think none of us set out to do that when we first got started in it, um, you know, but it was because of the fans, you know. I mean, it kept us going and um and all different. I mean, not only buying tickets, but, uh, you know, the fan mail and, you know, the responses and everything that we were getting from them. I mean, they'd put some, um, you know, if you didn't have any money, man, you could just think back to those memories and that would get you to the next show. Well, I want to make sure, you know, I want to do a couple more comments, definitely let a couple more people talk, but I want to make sure before I get you off here, let's talk about the Hall of Fame. I mean, 2013, Dan Patrick got inducted, you were inducted. I mean, how cool was that to get recognized from, you know, the Hall of Fame and shine forever? Yeah, I know it. Yeah, that was quite an honor. And, uh, you know, still it's hard to believe that I'm in there sometimes. And, um, you know, and with the people, other people that are there. Um, and like I said, I mean, you know, I didn't do it planning on getting in the Hall of Fame or, but I mean, it was just something, uh, you know, I put my uh, my heart and soul into it, and uh, man, I was dedicated to monster trucks, you know, and running the the three trucks at one time and uh, touring the country. I mean, I was I was definitely dedicated to it, and uh, you know, man, it's just um, it's just incredible, and it's really hard to believe, you know, that the sport has taken off and uh, went where it has. Well, Mason, you got to, we'll just keep them for a few more minutes. You got just like two more comments, two more good ones. Yep. Or do you, or to... do you need more time in that? I don't want to, I don't want to cut anybody off. Got any really good ones either. Yep. I'm at least trying to pick up the last three good ones here to end on a high note here. We have one from Pat Roy here saying, what was it like during your final two weekends before retirement 
Those two were Stafford and Hagerstown. And Stafford, there was uh, always something about Stafford Springs. You know, because I went up there with TNT, um, you know, probably started by like 88 or 89 up there at Stafford. And I went up there basically every year for, oh, Lord, probably um, close to 20 years. You know, and then, um, you know, when I joined the Gravedigger team, you know, some years they would send another driver up there just to depend on the scheduling and everything, but that was always a special place for me, and that was one of the places that you could go to in the early days that it was always packed. I mean, man, there was a huge monster truck fan base up there, but between there and uh, and West Lebanon, you know, so that was cool to go back up there, and then Hagerstown, you know, that place was, uh, it was always special, and I can remember going back to that track um, to see Jack Wilman. We were across town at the fairgrounds doing a mud bog with um with Dean Moore and Monsters on Wheels and Jack was there at the speedway crushing buses. And this was probably this was probably nineteen eighty six. And we hurry up and got done with our show. It was uh, myself, Gary Wiggins and Kirk Dabney. We hurried up and got done with our show when we um, tried to get over there at the Speedway in time to see Jack Wilman crush the buses, and he had already done it. But, uh, you know, that was another racetrack that I always liked. Uh, had a lot of good success there and was there a number of years. And so that was a good place to put an end to it, uh, you know, was right there at Hagerstown. And there was a lot of history made there at Hagerstown back in, uh, I think I have the year right, I'm thinking 89, you know, that's where Dennis said, I've had enough, you know, before he sold it out, you know, that was his, uh, he had had enough and he packed up and went home there at that racetrack. And that's when, um, you know, when he sold out to uh, Clear Channel or, or whoever it was at the time. So there are a lot of history there, you know, at the Hagerstown Speedway. Got a couple more, bud. Yep, have one from Mackenzie Ray again asking, do you miss driving any? And if you could drive one more time, where would you, where would you, and what would it be, or where would it be at? Sorry, read that. Yeah, I don't miss it as much as I thought I would. Um, I guess it was just time for me to get out. Uh, you know, I've um, got a great business and running heavy equipment and stuff. And man, that has really taken <coughs> off, um, you know, since I'm not doing the monster trucks anymore. And I, I stay so busy, you know, with it, I really haven't had time to miss the monster trucks that much, but occasionally, uh, you know, I have had that thought, well, if I could drive one more time or if I could do one more thing and, uh, but to name an event where I would want it to be, man, that would be a tough one there because I have a, a lot of memories so, from so many different um, venues and the buildings. And, man, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, the Houston Astrodome, man, that used to be the place. If you made it to the Houston Astrodome to do a show, man, you hit the big time. And, uh, you know, then it was, you know, if you made it to the world finals, you hit the big time. I mean, it's like, you know, over the years, they've just been different, different um, marks that you wanted to meet. And so, but the name of venue that I would, I would want it to be in, that would be a tough one. I really, I really wouldn't care. Um, but man, you yeah, know, sometimes I thought about if I had one more ride. Hmm. I know a ton of people would love to see it too. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. You got one more, bud? Yep. We're going to end it off with Trey Espinoza's question, which was, what was Gary's favorite show towards his retirement? Uh, well, probably one of my series that year. You know, uh, it was uh, down to the wire. I think it was down to the, like, the last performance between uh, myself and uh, Alex Blackwell. You know, I mean, 
um, that was that was real cool there to to take that event championship at the time I didn't know it was going to be my last year uh, driving I I pretty much sort of assumed it was I was sort of I was starting to read things between the lines and um, sort of getting things figured out and um, that's one thing I think I was always pretty good uh, to do was sort of read between the lines of a uh, management there at um, at, at Monster Jam, and uh, I really didn't get a lot of surprises from them. So when I got the phone call that they wasn't going to renew my contract, I wasn't really surprised. Well, Gary, I can't tell you what an honor it's been to have you on here. I mean, we've we've had some big names on here, and it's, it's been pretty awesome and to add you to the list. But I got to say – for me personally, it's really cool because when I was a kid, I had three monster truck t-shirts. I had Bigfoot, I had no problem. And I had Carolina crusher. Wow. And, and then I got to watch you in Kansas city at a few shows when you started driving grave digger, but then I'll never, and I'm not one that normally remembers what happens in years or whatever, but 2015 Ocala speedway, you and Carolina crusher parked next to us when I was with bounty hunter and Scarlet bandit. Okay, and I got to see a conversation with you in the pits was probably one of the coolest things ever. Where I, you know, one of the few awe moments I've had in this business. So, man, I reckon that's one of the regrets that I have. I mean, I, uh, I'm horrible at remembering names, you know, but uh, I can remember faces a lot better. And man, they've so many names that I just simply don't remember that I wish I had, you know, in the monster truck industry because I mean, uh. You know, it was always an honor. Um, you know, I say it was an honor now, but it wasn't at the time to get beat by some of these uh, young guns that, that's out here. But, you know, every time I would get beat by uh, – and you might have beat me this weekend. I mean, I, I don't remember, and I apologize for that. But, um, you know, every time I would get beat by one of these uh, – I'm going to say a young driver. I mean, it was always an honor in a sense because I knew that they were the – they were going to be in the sport longer than I was, you know, there the last few years, especially. And, um, you know, th they was going to keep the legacy going on, you know, with the monster truck industry and whole, and man, the, to see what these young guys are doing with these trucks right now. I'm like, man, wonder what I could have done if I had that truck with uh, that piece of equipment when I was, 21, 22, 23 years old. And, uh, you know, you do look at things a little different when you get, I'll be 59 in July when you get some age on you. But uh, it, it's still an honor, you know, to have raced with uh, a lot of these young drivers that are driving now and to see what they're doing with these trucks. I mean, it's just simply amazing. Well, that's what's even cooler because I'm actually just, I was Jimmy and Don's crew chief. And, and so you were just competing against Jimmy and Don Creighton. And that's what was even cooler is there I was just a crew guy and you still just sat there and bullshitted. And it was, uh, like I said, honestly, it was one of the coolest things ever of me getting to stay there and, you know, like I said, just have a conversation, talk about whatever with Gary Porter. So. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Well, sir, like I said, it was an honor to have you on and uh, maybe again in the future we can have you on and maybe we'll have a new story about you jumping in the seat at that point. Hey, maybe we can get a new telephone put up and we'll have video next time or something. Man, you know, it's raining here. I've got wet standing out here on this <laughs> telephone pole. And uh, But, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have some uh, some new high-tech gadgets and we can have video next time. I'll have I'll have Mason send you an iPhone 3. Hey, there you go. Three. <laughs> they make those now? Oh, yeah. They're all the way, they're all the way up past, just past there now. Oh, just past three. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you very much for being on, and we'll talk to you hopefully soon. All right. Thank y'all. Wow. Well, that was cool. Uh, I, like I said, I, I got to say that's one. I mean, I love all the guests we've had on. I mean, I haven't had a guest on I haven't enjoyed having, but that was uh, – yeah, that's I cannot say that's one of my heroes. So I'm I'm geeking out for a minute here, but I want to thank everybody for watching. Mason, I believe you have uh, some sponsor talk you need to do. Yep.
Of course, I'd like to thank Spur Hot Sauce. Spur Hot Sauce is a local-based Florida business where the Southwest meets the Southeast in a clang of hot and tangy flavors. When you want to spice up your next meal, think of Spur Hot Sauce. Make sure to give them a like and a contact on Facebook or Instagram and tell them MonsterCast sent you. Along with them, we also would like to thank Monster Truckinator TV, the place to go on Facebook for all things new and old Monster Truck related. And you okay there? Yep, that was it. Just oh, oh that, that, was an, wrong, guys. that was an abrupt end. All right. Well, once again, I want to thank everybody for watching. I'm sorry about the little technical difficulties, but I'm glad we were able to get that in. I said that truly was cool. I mean, um, like I said, I've loved every guest we've had, and it's been an honor to have multiple people on that we've had. And uh, But like I said, that was just one I was just kind of a super fan for. So like I said, I got to geek out. So I'm sorry if I hogged most of the competent con conversation. But make sure you guys join us Wednesday night. Uh, 8 p.m. Central for Wednesday night happy or hump day happy hour. We will have straight up racing driver of Rockstar Billy Payne. So that ought to be a good one. Uh, yeah, that dude ain't right. I know that for a fact. <laughs> All right. So I said thank you everybody for watching. Mason, any famous last words? And with oh. that, we will see you next week. See you guys.